Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm nearing the end of my second week of teaching on lessons from Joseph. And I tell you, this is powerful. These are truths that God has taken from the life of Joseph. He's applied directly to me. And I tell you, this has saved my bacon more than one time. I, this ministers to me. You know, I started with these verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says the reason these things were written were for our example so that we could learn through them. And that is exactly what's happened in my life. You know, I never personally went out and committed adultery and lied and steal and did dope and got drunk and I've never done any of these things. And some people would think, well, then how did you learn anything? The Word of God is given to teach us and to make us perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second. Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You don't have to learn everything by hard knocks. You can learn through the Word. And I tell you, I have gained tremendous revelation through Joseph, and I've applied these things to my life, and it has kept me on the path that God called me to when I was 18 years old. And I've not left it. Now, I've not done everything perfect. I'm not trying to present that, but I'm saying I've been seeking God and pressing in this direction, and there's times I've done it better than others, but I've been seeking God, and the example of Joseph and others from Scripture are a big part of that. If you are up and down like a yo-yo, and it seems like your life is inconsistent and stuff, I can guarantee you one of the reasons that you're like that is because you aren't learning from these people. You aren't keeping these things in front of you. You know, if you have problems with sexual sins, I guarantee you, you have not really studied the life of David and seeing what his sin with Bathsheba did and how it cost him. And his own children died as a result. And there was hatred and division. And tens of thousands of people died during the war with his son Absalom and on and on. And you can just see these consequences that pile up and pile up. If you were to meditate in that, and really study these things and keep those examples in front of you, I guarantee you, you would not live in sexual sin. If you would study Proverbs where it describes the adulterous woman and how that she flatters you and does all this, but her path leads to hell. And if you were to keep these things in front of your eyes, it would keep you from going out and committing adultery. If you were to take, take the scriptures that talk about whoever is deceived by wine is not wise. It's like a person who's trying to sleep on top of a flagpole. Imagine that. How are you ever going to stay up there without falling and hurting yourself? Man, that's what the Scripture says. Who, is, who has woe? Who has misery? Who has all of these problems? He that tarries long at the wine. And if you were to keep Scriptures like this in front of you, I guarantee it would keep you from being an alcoholic and being drunk. I, I, it's just amazing. The Word of God is given to literally set us free, not to bind us, but to set us free. And the reason our lives are so messed up is because of our ignorance or our ignoring or rejection of Scripture. Our society today has so many problems. All of the things that are happening in our society, the violence in our schools and all of this, people sit there and say, we need more gun regulation, we need metal detectors, we need all of this. Did you know back in the beginning days of our society and uh, all of the kids used to bring guns with them to school and you didn't have these mass shootings. You know why? Because we had morality. There was a godly restraint in the lives of people, but our so society has systematically rejected the Word of God and the standards of the Word. Don't let our children pray in school. Don't mention God and on and on. And because of it, that absence of godly influence has allowed Satan to just have free reign. All of these things are happening because people are not studying the Word of God. So anyway, I say all those things just to say that, man, Joseph is a great example. I have learned so much through him. We've already covered how that God gave him dreams. He gave him a word. He didn't have the written word. He got the word, the revelation of God through dreams. He knew that someday he would be exalted to such a place that his brothers and father would even come down and bow down and worship him. And yet, when he started proclaiming that, everything seemed to go bad. He went from a position of being highly favored in this rich house to where he was uh, nearly killed by his brethren. 
sold into slavery and standing on the auction block, he was still a prosperous man. He was believing God. The favor of God was on him. He was bought by Potiphar. Potiphar prospered him. He became the leader of his whole household. But Satan still came after him through the master's wife. She tried to get him into sexual sin, and he refused to do it because he said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He had a personal relationship with God that even though he could have gotten by with having a sexual relationship with his master's wife, and, you know, in, in just the natural, carnal, physical way of looking at things, it would have been satisfying. And here he was in a bad position where everything was going wrong. He could have thought, I owe this to myself. I need to indulge myself. But man, he just stayed faithful to God. And because of it, he was put in prison unjustly. His integrity caused him, it looked like, just to keep going lower and lower and lower. Most people would, they are so in tune with the physical things around them instead of in tune with God that they just wouldn't wade through all of these negatives that it takes to get to that place of fruitfulness. They would have compromised. They'd have given in. They'd have said it's not worth it. But you know, we have hindsight. We can see now the whole story. And of course, we know that Joseph got promoted and he became the, the strongest man in all of Egypt outside of Pharaoh himself. He was ruling over entire nations, other nations, and all of these things. All of his dreams with his brethren and his fathers came to pass. Because we know the end of the story, it was well worth the effort. But at this time, it took a visionary. It took somebody who was operating in faith to see that someday it was going to be worth maintaining your integrity and serving God. So he, his master's wife lied about him, and he got put in prison. And so in Genesis chapter 39 and in verse 20, it says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Did you know, again, this is just like Genesis chapter 39 verse 2, where Joseph was standing on the auction block. God says he was a prosperous man and God's favor was on him. Most people would say, that's not prosperous. That's poverty. That's being a slave. Most people would look at him in prison and say, this isn't God's favor. God's not with him. God's forsaken him. See, this is what people would say, and sad to say, Satan will even get us to say it to ourselves. When things don't look like they're working, there's a temptation to think, well, God's just forgotten me. You know, again, my own personal experience, I had this relationship with the Lord, God put in my heart that I was going to reach millions of people worldwide. And then the first church I pastored had a maximum of 12 people coming. Usually it was just five. And I did that for two years. And then for the next two years, I pastored a group of about 50, maybe 60 maximum. And I did that for two years. And then I went to a place... And we had a hundred people coming to church. Now that was relatively good because the church, the town only had 144 people in the town. So that was some positive things, but still that's a far cry from ministering to millions of people worldwide. And did you know that during this period of time, everybody else, anytime I'd speak forth my vision, would sit there and tell me, you're crazy. People are staying away from your meetings by the thousands. You're reaching dozens, not millions. And they would just criticize my vision, say it's never going to happen. And you know what? There was times that I thought it was never going to happen. And I had to fight and resist those things and fight discouragement. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison. You cannot evaluate God's favor on your life just in terms of physical things. You have to go by what God has spoken to you. And there is a period of time in between when you receive that vision and when you say, there it is and can see it come to pass. And you're going to have to remain faithful and walk by faith during the meantime. But the Lord was with him in prison. And look at this. You can see that the Lord was with him because in the next verse it says, And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Again, this kind of favor 
and prosperity on a person doesn't come to pass without their cooperation. If you're in unbelief, if you're in rebellion, if you're sitting there sucking your thumb and complaining about how bad things are, I guarantee you, you are not going to see this prosperity. Again, the very fact that the keeper of the prison saw this and entrusted all of these prisoners to Joseph speaks volumes about Joseph. Joseph was not a defeated, bitter, angry person. You know, we just had a guy who's a friend of mine who has spoken in our Bible college before. Uh, I reconnected with him and he asked to come speak in our Bible college. And anyway, they asked me about him. They said, do you want him to come speak? And I said, well, he's spoken before. And yes, I would have him come speak again. But I said, you just need to be careful because there is a hurt in this man. There is a bitterness in this man that every time I've ever heard him speak, it comes out. And he was treated unfairly by some major ministries. And he's had some bad things happen. But this bitterness is always there. And when he spoke in our Bible college before, I had to come in afterwards and kind of clean up some things because there were some people that picked up on it, didn't know what was happening. I had to explain to them. The point that I'm making is most of us get bitter over things. We sit there and, and it influences us. But Joseph wasn't like that. Here was Joseph in prison. If anybody had a right to complain and to be griping and complaining and just throw up his hands and sit over in the corner and just sit there and waste every single day in nothing but depression and discouragement, it was Joseph. Joseph would have been justified by most people's standards to do that. But Joseph was succeeding and excelling even in prison, so much so that the, the keeper of the prison just turned everything over to Joseph. Now, it doesn't say it in this instance, but in the New Testament during the time of the Romans, if a keeper of a, a jail or a prison had a prisoner escape, then whatever punishment was going to happen to the prisoner, they did it to the jailer. If the prisoner was going to be executed, they would kill the jailer. And you can see this in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts because there when the earthquake came and everybody's prison doors were open and uh, the jailer awoke from his sleep and he just supposed that the people had fled and he knew that he would be put to death. So he was going to kill himself. And Paul had to cry out and say, don't do yourself any harm. And the man wound up getting born again as a result. But that's the way it was under the Roman system. I suspect that it was the same under this Egyptian system. And maybe if it wasn't total death, he was going to be punished if something happened because he was the one that Pharaoh had designated to keep this prison. So the very fact that the keeper of the prison just put everything into Joseph's hand and didn't even know what was going on, he didn't even ask, it shows that he saw the favor of God on Joseph. He saw the faithfulness of Joseph. He saw God's blessing on Joseph. That doesn't happen when a person is just sitting in their house in the dark, depressed with the lights off, sitting there just licking their wounds and doing things. This says volumes about Joseph once again, that Joseph was still serving God. He still was hopeful. He still was believing that the word that God had given him was going to somehow or another come to pass. Joseph was still in faith. You don't see this kind of anointing, this kind of uh, advancement and other people seeing the blessing of God on your life if you're in defeat and discouragement yourself. If you're in unbelief, that doesn't come across. Again, without saying it, this says that Joseph was still faithful. He was still believing God. He was still a positive, happy person. He was still trusting God after years and years and years of this. This story goes on to say that he interpreted these dreams from these two prisoners, and it was two years later when one of the prisoners remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh and brought him out. So we don't know the total amount of time he was in the prison, but we know he was there at least two years. And again, we know from Genesis chapter 41 that Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Genesis 37, 2 says he was 17 years old when he got these dreams. So that's 13 years, at least two of those years, maybe two, three, or four of those years, he was in prison. The other time he was in Potiphar's house as a slave. But for 
15 years, Joseph had been just treated wrong, sold into slavery, nearly killed by his brethren, sold into slavery, lied about by the master's wife, put in prison. Everything that was happening to him was, was wrong. And yet for 13 years, this man maintained his faith, maintained his positive attitude, kept believing God and kept trusting God. Let me just say to you that, you know what, I'm not saying you haven't had bad things happen to you. I'm not saying you haven't been through some problems. You may be in a terrible situation. But is it any worse than what's happened to Joseph? You know, I just really don't believe that there's a part, person watching this program. There's 3.2 billion people on this planet who could watch this program. And I don't believe that there's a single one of you that could sit there and say that what's happened to me is worse than what's happened to Joseph. And Joseph had, a, had terrible things. Unjustly, his brothers hated him and turned on him. And he nearly got killed by them. Then he sold into slavery. And then because of his faithfulness to his master and his integrity to his God and faithfulness to his God, his master's wife lied about him and he got put in prison and he stayed in prison for years. And all of this was totally unjust. There's nobody that's been through stuff like that. If Joseph did this without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without the Word of God to encourage him, without examples like Joseph to encourage him, then how, what excuse do we have for doing all of these things? What excuse do we have for giving up, for being so discouraged? You know, I know the way I'm approaching this right now is not popular. I have people criticize me all the time. You aren't compassionate. You aren't sensitive. You don't understand the hurts that people have been through. And they talk about, oh, that pressures are worse today than they've ever been and all of these kind of things. You know, the Scripture says that there's nothing new under the sun. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted Above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. The Word of God teaches that, you know what, we can overcome all of these things. The way that the world approaches, even Christian uh, religious people, you're just supposed to have compassion. You're supposed to sit down there and just be as depressed and discouraged as these people are. I'm telling you, if I get down and wallow in defeat and discouragement the way that you are, I can't help you. I'm trying to draw you up and bring you up higher. I'm not trying to condemn you and make you feel bad, but I am trying to say that, you know what, get over it. There's nothing going on in your life that you can't handle. That scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, has helped me many times when I thought, God, I just can't handle anymore. This is more than I can take. I've remembered God said He wouldn't suffer me to be tempted above what I was able. If I, if I was in this situation, that must mean that I can make it or God would not have allowed it to happen. I'm not trying to condemn you. I am being compassionate on you. I'm compassionate enough to tell you the truth and try and get you to, to get up and get out of this situation. Get over it. You know, I had a situation where I moved to Pritchett, Colorado. And I gave this example earlier that, you know, I started out in Seagaville, Texas, 12 people maximum. I moved to Childress, Texas. We had 50 to 60. And even though that wasn't huge, for the first time, it looked like we were going to eat on a regular basis. Uh, I could see light at the end of the tunnel, and it wasn't another train. It looked like I was going to live. And the Lord told me to leave all of that and move to Pritchett, Colorado, a town of 144 people, 10 people in the church, to give up whatever momentum I'd gained and go minister in this little place that if it's not the end of the earth, you could see it from there. It was that close. And after I moved there, it wasn't just a few weeks, I had people accusing me of committing adultery, stealing money from the church, doing drugs. I had people coming out against me and I just got so discouraged that I was going to quit. I just decided I was going to have a pity party I was waiting on Jamie and the boys to go to bed. And they, they were in bed, and I was waiting on them to go to sleep. And I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I had already planned my pity party. I'd sent out all my invitations. All of the demons in Baca County, Cal uh, Colorado, were 
showing up to attend my pity party, and I was going to go down into the basement and just tell the Lord how unfair this was, how I gave up so much to come there, and just gripe and complain. And I knew I shouldn't do it, but I just thought I'll feel better if I do. That's what the world has to say. And as I sat down and just waiting on them to go to sleep, I happened to turn over to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And as soon as I read that, I knew my own teaching, the things that the Lord had shown me, that in the Spirit I had love, joy, and peace. In my flesh, in my emotions, I had discouragement. I was wanting to quit. I was ready to give up. I was ready to throw in the towel. And I knew what that scripture said, and I knew that this was the Lord telling me, you stand and don't give in to this. But man, I wanted to give in to it. I wanted to just get down on the floor and cry and gripe and complain. But as I prayed about it, the Holy Spirit began to remind me of things. He gave me, He reminded me of visions that God had put in my heart. And anyway, by the time Jamie and the boys got to bed, I went down into the basement and instead of doing what I wanted to do, what I felt like doing, I did what I knew I was supposed to do. And I just started praising God and thanking God and worshiping God when it looked like that there wasn't a single reason to be doing it. I did it by faith. And I tell you, within just a short period of time, I mean the joy of the Lord, the power of God was flowing through me. And praise God, I made it. I don't know what the results would have been if I'd have given in to that. It's possible that, you know what, that would have been the end of my ministry. It's possible that, man, I'd have been struggling ever since then. It's probable that I, you certainly wouldn't have ever seen me on television. You'd have never gotten anything good from me. You know, it was a turning point. And there's some of you right now that you may be at a place and you just feel like, well, how much does God want me to take? There's no temptation taking you, but such as you can handle. God's faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted above that you're able. Look at Joseph. Joseph was able to still be praising God, even in the pit, even in prison. If Joseph did it without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without the Word of God, without some television preacher trying to encourage him and build him up, you can do it. I'm not saying these things to be hard on you. I'm saying it to help you. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. You need to stand up. Don't give up. Man, Joseph was in the pit, and in just a matter of minutes, he was in the palace. He was ruling the nation. It, it could be a, you could be right on the verge of moving from the pit to the palace. Man, that's awesome. Did you know that when you partner with Andrew Womack Ministries, you are also supporting over 40 other ministries and organizations? Ministries like Christ in Action, who were on the scene in Wimberley, Texas after it was hit by a devastating flood. We're bringing in volunteers from all across America. We're here to help. We're help ease the pain and save some labor. And we're helping gut homes. We're helping to tear out houses, the sheetrock, the insulation, the mold, the muck, the wet furniture. It's people like you who enable ministries like Christ in Action to be there when disaster strikes to not only build their homes, but to help build their faith, ministering the love of Christ. This is spiritual stuff. Tearing sheetrock out of somebody's house, pulling furniture out of their house, pulling their carpets up, getting dirty, working alongside of people. Because Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. We are a 100% volunteer organization. So everybody that gives 100% goes to boots on the ground people helping people in devastating situations. And Christ in Action is just one of the many examples of how your support is impacting lives all over the world. We encourage you to become part of the amazing things God is doing through this ministry. Go to awmi.net slash give for more information on how to get involved.